Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. As you prefer, I'm just saying. Okay, everybody can hear me like this. It's okay. Good. So I welcome everybody. Thank for be thanks for being here, and thanks to the organizers and program committee to accept this talk. I think this talk is rather exceptional in this conference because uh, there's a little logic and a lot of algebra and actually group theory. And uh, but on the title you see at least something: the existential theory in graph products. And I should say it's a based work with Murray, who is here, and Markus, who is not here, he's in Germany. He was my former student, and now he's professor in Siegen. Okay, so I think I go ahead. And so my talk will have three parts, as you see. I start with the notation. Then maybe the most interesting part for you is a little bit the history of the things. So what has been done, who had been done what? And so uh, there will be a lot of famous names will appear so that it is important. What I'm doing is proof by authority. Yeah, okay. It's called proof by authority. So then I will speak about solution sets and E-D-T-O-L. So that's not an O, actually it's a zero, but you see there, it's very, and here, you know, the people who know what it is, they write it like this, and the others put an O. This is a frightening name, but I will try to explain a little bit what it is. Then I will speak about graph products. Graph products appeared already in the title. That's an algebraic construction. And I will state two results, and these are the two main results. OK. So this is part one. And uh, so as I said, this is a talk on groups and logic. And a monoid, this is a quote, I think, by Paul Schupp, who he quoted of somebody else. A monoid is a group which might have missed its better parts, you know, its inverses. And well, the logic, we had it here, that sometimes you must be, it's important. So n this plus is a monoid, and every monoid has a neutral element. And therefore, my conclusion is, and that's important, zero is a natural number. You know? This is not, uh, that's maybe not, it's debatable whether some mathematicians pretend zero is not a natural number, but of course it's very natural to have it as a natural number. So now here I come to the notation. So although we the results are on groups, we have to work with monoids. Yeah, so that's important. And if you, you speak about equations, and if you speak about equations, you need variables. And if you speak about a theory, then you need uh, typically an countable set of variables. And then you form the disjoint union of the monoid and the variables. And in my talk, finite subsets, because in the formulas there are only finitely many variables which will appear, they are denoted as x calligraphic x. And then a word equation is simply a pair of these two things. And we write them as u equals v. But of course, as words, they are not equal, typically. Otherwise, the equation would be trivial. And then formulas are quantified Boolean expressions over word equations. And then if you, as usual in logic, then you define free and bounded variables. And uh, this is not very important here, because all variables or the results are actually on formulas where all variables are free. There's no quantifier at all. And then a sentence is a formula which has three uh, variables. And the first order theory or elementary theory of a monoid is a set of all sentences which evaluate to true in your favorite monoid. Yeah? And for example, uh, this if you have such a sentence that for all x, x is y, and x is a square, this is true for complex numbers. We heard about it last, just the complex numbers are there. And in R, if you are drawing minus the square root of minus one, but it's false in R and Q. And the existential theory of M is the true sentences in pre next normal form with, ex, with existential quantifiers. No? So it's existential theory. And, and now I come to the history, and I once gave. Uh, talk and wrote a letter, an article, which was, uh, had some reason why, why it's called it. I called it more than 1,700 years of uh, word equations. 
And funny enough, this article is cited very often <laughs> compared to other things. So, and I always start that Diophantus of Alexandria, when in particular, if you look at linear, linear Diophantine systems, this is a special case of a word equation over a unary alphabet. And very often we go back by induction to unary alphabet, so it's good. Huh? So Diophantus uh, started this, this is more than 1,300 1, years, 700 years ago. Then, but it became much more interesting, this Hilbert tenth problem, uh, which he, you know, he had these problems at the Math Congress of Mathematicians, Paris 1900, but this problem was actually published later and during the conference he never spoke about this. So I think it was published 1903. Then uh, the next big step here for word equations was by Tarski, and there is a question mark you see here, because I was not pretty sure whether it was 1948 or 1944, 5 or 1951. No? But anyway, he proved that the elementary theory of the reals is decidable. And this is really a great and remarkable result. Yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic if you think about it, that you can, uh, the constants are here, the rationals, you have addition, multiplication, and the predicate less, yeah, and you still can, can decide it, and uh, it's a real breakthrough result, I think, and at the end, the proof is not that difficult, so the modern proofs, which I saw, is that you can lecture in, in two hours, easily, and everybody can understand it, and the... <laughs> Um, the deep thing inside is what you don't have in rational or integers is that you have in how it's called this mean mean value theory or something like this. If you have positive and negative values that you find in the polynomial that you are zero. That's that's the trick. Then uh, Tarski's again, I do not really know when he, when it pops up. Uh, he conjectures the same thing about free groups. That the uh, that the elementary theory of of free groups is decidable, and moreover, he said also that all uh, all free groups of rank at least two have the same elementary theory. Yeah. And it's again uh, unbelievable, uh, remarkable uh, conjecture. It's a bold conjecture at this time. And then again, so in the 1960s. It became clear that word equations, what I'm studying here, is a special instance of Hilbert Tenth's problem. And so the, the attempting idea was to prove that word equations is undecidable. Yeah. And then in, you know, word equations are Turing machines or so. And then that was the idea. And Yuri Matyasevich told me he was sent along this road that was this target. He should prove it. But I think he was skeptical a little bit from the very beginning, because in 1968, when he was 20, uh, he showed already that the set of all quadratic word equations, or the decidability of, of quadratic word equations, is very easy. Quadratic means that every variable, variable appears at most twice. And he actually showed it by this ED2L language. Yeah? But of course, <laughs> Matthias Sevich never had heard about ED2L, and I think they were not defined at this point. Yeah, but if you look at the proof of today, that's really the very first simple thing where you can prove that the description of all solutions is ED2L. And then uh, Matthias Sevich became more and more skeptical. And at age 22, he proved that Hilbert is undecidable. And he used uh, uh, the works of Davis, Putnam, and Robinson. And he himself calls the theorem not Matyasevich theorem, but Matyasevich, Davis, Putnam, Robinson theory. Yeah. Uh, but and this was Cold War. And so he was forced, the, the Russians wanted that a young guy pro proved this. Yeah? So they were very, very eager to it. And then the program f fully failed to prove uh, Hilbert 10 is undecidable via this way because Makani proved what, what equation is decidable. Yeah. So, and then after that, uh, positive theory became decidable. Rasborov proved that the maximal rank of solutions in a given equation in a free group is computable. And this will be explained in full detail by Murray. And then, uh, there are the task is conjecture about free groups were solved by Myasnikov, Kalampovich, and Sela. And uh, Monse Salz-Ruiz and Ilya Kazakhkov 
uh, they ex uh, they did it for right angle arting groups and i mentioned it here because my business or i came in via right angle arting groups and this thing yeah here's a historical remark yeah that <laughs> there's some of you have i don't know whether anybody has heard about Ehren for its conjecture if not it doesn't matter <laughs> anyway that that's a proof that was in the 70s formulated and uh, but it was trivial if you see the third equations thing anyway so now myself i'm in computer science i started in uh, i did my phd actually in algebraic number theory uh, so about galois groups over periodic fields and so my main thing until my phd was working group theory and algebra and algebraic geometry a little bit and but then I came to computer science, and then I had to learn uh, what, how to model uh, concurrent events or concurrent processes and event structures and these things. And the algebraic foundations are by these three partially commutative monoids, which were introduced by Kaki Fuata in, 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 in 1968, actually by Fuata, I think. And independently, actually, I think they did not know of each other, or Keller did not know this, um, by Keller in computer science. And he already said this, this is a model for parallel program schemata. That was the title of his paper. And uh, then it turned out that in computer science, uh, we call the trace monoids, which is at least shorter. But trace is, of course, an overused word. But anyway, that's a standard notation now. And this was coined by Mazakiewicz. And then once you have a trace monoid, you can define a right angle arting group or free partially commutative group or graph group by this way that you that you take the, the traces, the trace monoid, and then you add the formal inverses and and you you say a a to the minus one is equal to one, and this gives a group. So you have see here again three names or three notations, and this is again proof uh, that the theory is important. Yeah? Because if people from different areas came up with different notation, like uh, graph groups or free partially commutative groups and right angle arting groups, and right angle arting groups turned out to be very important in three dimensional uh, topology. This is due to the work of uh, Danny Weiss and others. Yeah? So. That was lucky for me because I was, was studying them because they popped up in a, in a natural way. I mean, I had to work with trace monoids, but I came from group theory. Of course, I looked at these things. And OK, and then um, that's the final thing, well, almost the final thing about history. So Yuri, I, I learned Yuri, and Yuri uh, came to Stuttgart for a year, not in one year, but overall in one year because he had a Humboldt Prize, and then we started to work together. And the first thing he did, but then we improved it, and uh, with Yuri that we showed this word equations solve and free partially commutative monoid, and actually it's in P space. And Anka Mushal was working there, and actually she was my very first student I ever had. And maybe some of you in computer science and logic might know her name. She is in program committees of LIX or so, or CSL, and published a paper of, uh, of in computer science. She is actually the wife of uh, Igor Valakiewicz, who's also quite well known, I think, here, maybe here in this area. Um, OK, and then we uh, proved here that the existential theory is decidable in graph products. And then in, in topology, again, it became important. Damani Giradel showed this, that you can, the decidability uh, in, in, in free groups, virtually free groups, and hyperbolic groups. Hyperbolic groups uh, are extremely important since the work of Gromov. And the good thing for, for me or myself was that they rely on a concept and a paper I had written earlier. This, as a student, and we introduced what we called recognizable or rational constraints. And this is an important step here. Anyway, so then, uh, 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 yeah, we continued more. Everything is here. Maybe I go to this here. I, I think I skipped a thing where there's our results. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's intermezzo here. I don't know. I, I, it was too early. So you see, uh, now I come to ED2L. Yeah? And here it's funny. So 
uh, we, we started our work in, in Newcastle at Gagda and now in Brisbane, Brisbane. And that's where the results, we are still working on this. Yeah? So, and now it's finished and so it covers a long story. You see ED12 means extended deterministic table, zero interaction in Lindenmeyer system. So it's so frightening. Nobody was likes to know what it is. Yeah, it's the most frightening thing um, you can understand. But we, we solved it. And it turned out it's still, in some sense, it's the best you, you know, formal languages. There are regular languages, context-free languages. And then there are indexed languages, which are already very complicated and used in program uh, for programming languages, I think. And in between, this ED12 is the second best after, after uh, third best after context-free languages. They do not include, they are a little bit like this in Venn diagrams, but uh, anyway. So it's it is it's fantastic. So and then you see we did here all the work uh, with Laura Cubano and, and Murray. They are the heroes now. They did everything for hyperbolic groups, and uh, then in the recent years, students of Laura and uh, but not all of them, Evans, Duncan, Holt, and Levine, Sarah Reese, and others. They they produce more ED12 results. So this again proof by authority that it's important. Now, what I want to uh, speak here about is uh, how that we find all solutions. So if you find all solutions in particular, know, you know whether there exists a solution and it turned out to be much more difficult. Yeah? And for example, to say to decide finiteness, uh, can we decide whether, if I give a word equation, whether there are finite or infinitely many solutions? Yeah. And uh, so if you have a formula without set, without quantifiers, then you map the variables to elements in the monoid, and the solution is, after replacing this, this is correct in M. Yeah. And if you had a variable equation, you can think of tau as a homomorphism, which leaves the constants invariant, and then it simply says tau of u is equal to tau of v. Yeah. And uh, the, our main result is a transfer result. So if, uh, if you have a graph product, it's built up by a set of monoids. And if in this monoid you have a good property, and the property is good, then it should hold in the graph product. That's the philosophy of the whole thing. Yeah? So you give me a collection of monoids or groups. Everything is fine. You have a property which you believe is it's important. And then if it's really important, it's also important that they have closure properties. And the very natural one is a graph product of them. And uh, in some sense, uh, it's always true, whatever it means, what always means, I don't know. Uh, but we have to, uh, before I can do so, I have to, uh, to address the following questions. So what is an effective description of a solution? What, what, do you, what do I mean by this? What the hell is an ED to L relation? And I claim they are nice, but you don't know what it is, so you don't know what's nice in them. And, uh, and what, what is a graph product? I don't know whether uh, you have seen graph products before. I don't know, not. You have seen free products of monoids. You have seen... Uh, Direct products of monoids, yes, everybody says yes. And a graph product is something in between. It's a mixture of both. Yeah? So it's just a mixture. So what is effective uh, uh, solution? So you want to see a solution only once. So you use normal forms. Yeah? Normal form is just that you go back to, you have a presentation by an uh, finitely generated monoid, and then the normal form is something that you go back and you will have to see then the identity. And now we express the solutions. We make sure that all the solutions we write down in normal forms. Yeah. So every element has own, monoid has only one representation. And so the solution is mapping sigma like solution, but the it is a solution if the if you project it down in M, then it makes the formula correct. Yeah? But having the words, it's very nice. Because on monoids, you cannot say that uh, some element should start with an A or not start with an A. But on words, you can do it. And you see here, uh, I cannot, I don't know whether I can point to it. Oh, yeah, I can point, you see here. You see, uh, I could not express this in, in the monoid, but this is a, what I called a regular 
constrained. So I want to have solutions only in normal forms where the normal forms start with an A, yeah? but then it should not fall out by a B. Yeah? And this is a regular language, you see? So I say, now I restrict my solutions. Yeah? But on the other hand, I'm more general because just to say A is in gamma star is trivial. Yeah? So it's really more general of the theory. And the trick that everything worked, I told you so far after Markanin, uh, is using such constraints. Actually, Markanin asked in his original paper on groups already yeah. something which, whether you can restrict that the variables should be in a finitely generated subgroup. Yeah? And this was open until, uh, uh, until Mark Sapir wrote me. This, this was open until our paper. This, that we can solve equation in free groups with rational constraints. So again, so an effective description is now, you should think of a two-phase algorithm. In the first phase, I decide whether I'm finite. In the second phase, if it's finite, then, then okay, then it lists all the solution and then the normal form you don't really can care. Yeah? They list one solution after another, say in uh, length, length lexicographical normal form and if finished, the algorithm should also say, yes, now I've finished, huh? because you don't know how long you should wait. The list can be very long. But if, it, it, if it's not finite, it's, so it's infinite, then it should enumerate all solutions. And not again, in order to know whether it's a solution, you need some linear order, for example, short legs ordering. And then you know whether there is a solution, you list all of them, and uh, if up to some length, your, it doesn't appear, then it will never appear if you have a bounded. Yeah? And in all these theories, you can always know if there's a solution, there's a minimal one, which essentially is of exponential length. Yeah? So I wait, this, this, I've seen all uh, solutions of exponential length, and uh, then I can actually stop. So it would contradict, then it must be fine. fine yeah? oh. It's just a little bit great. So now NFAs. So you, have, have you seen NF, non deterministic finite automata in your computer science lecture or mathematical thing? So, okay, good. So we work with NFAs and still I use for simplicity uh, just uh, one initial state, but this is nonsense and usual and uh, final states. And now the only thing is the, the delta, the, the relation is labeled with monoid elements. You know, instead of words or letters or monoid elements, and then the accepted language is has now two existential quantifiers. It says there is a path and there is a factorization of my monoid element that I can read it. Yeah? So it's a two-step existential thing, but then it's. And this is a family of so-called rational subsets. And now here comes a statement with his mind, because the co-authors do not agree with me. Uh, when you teach courses, yeah, or any other thing, uh, free monoids, simply forget about DFAs. They're good for nothing. Yeah? That's the worst thing you can do. Yeah. So that's so that's my remark. Mori says no. <laughs> it's okay. That's a provocation, of course. Uh, effective description. So now I, here's a definition, and you see the definition extremely simple of an ED2L language. The ED2L language means that there was, you remember there was extended, this word extended here. You can read it here, there's extended. You need to extend this alphabet of constants by some delta. Then you need a non deterministic finite automaton over a monoid. And the monoid in this case is very, uh, is very precisely defined. It's a monoid of endomorphisms over delta star. It's neither, neither, I mean, uh, neither finitely generated or presented, nothing. It's a huge thing. But still, you have the notion of uh, NFA. And then you start the initial state. You can actually choose to be a letter, which is not the original one. And the initial states are, uh, and the initial state are such that the system uh, that is S. We want to define when S is an ed language. Now I say if S happens to be the uh, the thing, yeah. And, and for solving equations, we need some more minor technical co uh, constraints to get what we wish. For example, finiteness. Or so, but essentially, this. That's uh, now you see. 
And then uh, we call it a relation. And here I do a favor to my co-authors. If you plug in uh, some fresh symbols in it that you can separate them, it's like a comma. And this should be a, then an ED2L language. Yeah? So this is a solution set of all, of all equations is then an ED2L language. So the proof is easy. But the existential proof that exists, that's a difficult thing. Yeah? That takes pages and pages and pages. Yeah? That's, that's difficult. So, and, but, and what we do in our paper with, with Murray, and, and we rely on this fact, that we had this possibility of constructions of NFA was possible for free partially commutative monoids, so the trace monoids. Yeah? That was that's, that's a crucial central result. And the other thing is also well known. ED12 is nice. And why it's nice, you, you need a proof. You can create a wonderful forest of trees looking all similar, but no tree is identical to another one. That's one application you could have for ED12. I say that's done in Lord of the Rings. Well, that, uh, somebody from New Zealand were here, we could ask. Maybe Jackson, but he, didn't, he never said, but it looks like ED12. Uh, there are many useful applications. Okay, part three. So graph products I slowly come to an end. I think I've I started two minutes late. Yeah, maybe I start two minutes earlier. <laughs> stop! Stop! To, to, stop! Stop! To me. So we need. Uh, we heard this in the first lecture. In order to prove that something is useful, you at least you need examples. Yeah? We don't want to make a theory about the empty set, which is possible, but. Not so interesting. Uh, so free monoids, I told you, and free commutative monoids are examples of uh, graph products. The one is a free product. The other one is a direct product. These free partially commutative groups over an undirected graph, uh, which, I, which I defined like this. So the gamma i is an undirected graph. And then we just take commutations that you see you have partial commutation. It means it's a mixture of no commutation, full commutation. And these, uh, I call here trace monoid. And if you have, uh, so typically in mathematics, you use as formal symbols if there's an a, a to the minus one. But I think it, it should not be done because it's a formal symbol. And the better thing is you have an involution, a set with involution. And the involution means that a bar bar is a on the letters. And then you can have an independence relation. You only need that this is compatible with the involution. And then right angle Artin groups and, for example, right angle coxeter groups have the same description. Yeah? You just do A, A bar is one. And you don't need the other one because A bar bar is one. Yeah? And, uh, and it turned out somehow the whole theory, what we are doing, since Makani, I should say, is that to work with monoids or in the category of monoids with involution. Yeah, so that's already in Makani's original work. Yeah. That uh, so the category for equa solving equation is a category of monoids with involution. So here are our two results. Yeah. So now that's in the spirit I told before, and I put this uh, date of today. Well, this year. So the input is a graph product as above and Boolean expressions, uh, phi of word equation in a variable set X. So what we, what we want to do. And if for each group, GI, so it's, it's about a graph product of groups for some index set, the corresponding problem has an effective uh, solution, has an effective description of the solution set, then we can lift this to the solution set of, of the graph product. Yeah? And this is, I believe, quite important closure properties for this class of monoids where you have such a good situation. And actually, you can put in many other properties like normal forms, as I said, normal forms with respect to evolution. The same th thing holds. Yeah? Uh, you are a group. The graph product is a group if and only if each GI is a group. Yeah? Uh, it's a monoid with involution if and only if MI is a monoid with involution. And here I said it's better uh, that an ED12 relation in particular gives you an effective description. Yeah? And the, but there's much more structure. Yeah, in the first theorem, there's no structure. 
and here is a structural result. Yeah, and uh, I think I forgot a little bit if I have many more slides, but I don't think so. So, ah, you see, that's my final slide. So this is the main. These are the main results. Yeah? But uh, it's perfect. So we can. I can drive, fly back to Germany. It's finished. I will fly next week. No, no. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> they sent you. You, you know, give applause because I finished. <laughs> no, you yeah, see, I finished. 